Our next speaker is Dr. Margaret Miller. She is the Director of Research um, for Secor International. Um, and before that, spent a long time working as a reef ecologist with NOAA Fisheries um, in South Florida. And her talk today is, is there a future for corals outside the aquarium? So let's welcome Dr. Miller. Thanks very much. And I also want to thank uh, the organizers of MACNA. It's a great opportunity um, to be here this weekend. Um, I am not an aquarium keeper, so I've had a lot to learn, and it's been exciting to um, interact with a bunch of folks that know a lot about corals um, in a different way than I do. So it's really been a privilege to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak to you today. Um, as was introduced, I work with Seacor International. This is a nonprofit conservation organization um, focused on coral restoration, but using larval propagation. And so we'll be talking about that um, a little bit later in the talk. But I wanted to give a little bit of background and a little bit of understanding about uh, corals in the real world. Um, many of you, I know, share my um, amazement about corals because you uh, live with them. Um, on a daily basis, but really part of what makes, I think, corals uh, amazing and intriguing critters is this sort of animal, vegetable, mineral uh, dichotomy, trichotomy, um, right? Corals are, in fact, all three, not just two. And this is um, the capacity or part of the characteristic, I think, that make them so amazing and, uh, and, and it sort of goes with the amazing things that, that corals do. Um, corals, of course, are animals but they have these tiny plants that live inside their tissues, and so they're able to produce most of their own food, um, and that enables them as well, that combination of um, photosynthesis and animal consumption enables them to create rock, right? So that's the coral reef that we enjoy as this calcium carbonate skeleton that they make. So they really are incorporating all of these um, components in a single organism and then we also have, on top of that, this amazing microbiome that we're just beginning really to understand the important role that microbes play in corals in terms of their health and resilience. And um, this is really an area of, of active research. And I was excited to see um, the graduate fellowship uh, recipient, Mike Connolly. Um, this is really the focus of his research is how these microbes um, affect coral resilience and health. And this is a really important area of, of research to improve um, both husbandry practices, but understanding how corals work, but then also hopefully ultimately improving their fate in the field, because certainly disease is one of the major um, things that's causing uh, coral declines in the ocean. Um, but this capacity to build rock structures um, is really what accounts for much of the value that human societies derive from corals in terms of constructing reefs. Um, they provide the foundation for this architectural structure that provides habitat for fisheries. Um, it provides habitat for this amazing amount of biodiversity um, that occupy coral reefs. And as, as a result of these, um, including sort of coastal protection, um, there's tremendous economic value that derives from these ecosystem services. In addition, as you all know, and as evident around this place and in the, in, uh, the hall here, corals provide a tremendous amount of beauty and enjoyment to us. And that's, I think, the motivation that many of you have for uh, the amazing investment and effort that you put into um, living with them and raising them. And this is true both um, in, in the wild and nature. Um, that's the basis of a lot of, again, tourism and a lot of the economic value that derives to natural coral reefs through tourism, but also through um, uh, corals and beauty that we enjoy in tanks and that people um, invest in. And as I was preparing for this talk a little bit, again, as I said, I don't know a lot about aquaria and raising, raising corals in tanks, but I was sort of struck. Um, I am familiar with the amazing work that Jamie Craig's does, and we got to hear about that earlier this morning. Um, but this amazing uh, capacity and technology that's developed around um, keeping corals in tanks and raising coral in aquaria and the amazing advances um, that have happened over time as we have learned and developed and technology has developed and just trial and error and human persistence in um, enabling these organisms to thrive in captivity. And these are just a, a few um, of those developments that I sort of learned about in doing a little bit of research on the web. Um, 
but as I said, culminating really in the capacity that, that Jamie Craig's has developed to get corals in such a natural environment in such a healthy state that they're able to undergo natural reproductive cycles um, in captivity. Um, it's also somewhat sobering to understand that this amazing positive trajectory and what, what we're able to do with corals and tanks is sort of contrasted um, by their fate in the wild. And, um, you know, these are data for a couple of different Caribbean species or coral Caribbean in general. And, you know, what you notice here is that that arrow really is going very drastically um, in the opposite direction. And so as our capacity to uh, make corals happy in captivity has advanced so tremendously, um, the fate of corals in the wild has um, really become quite uh, in jeopardy. Um, that was the data, but I think these um, photographs also illustrate perhaps better um, what this really means in, in wild coral reefs. Uh, Jean Shin, who worked for the U.S. Geological Service for a long time in South Florida, um, assembled these amazing time series photographs of uh, reef sites in the Florida Keys. And so um, this is one of those sites. Again, he has photos going back to 1961. You can see those tremendous and diverse um, coral communities here going from 1961, um, the community changing a little bit, the acropora is really dominating for a period of time, the acropora is disappearing, um, and then this gradual progression where what we have now is virtually no hard corals at all, um, and there's a, a rich community of soft corals. But again, those are not serving quite the same um, ecosystem services as those um, reef building hard corals do. And this sort of scene and progression is repeated um, many, many, many places throughout the Caribbean. And so there's the why, why does this happen? What has been the, the cause of such drastic declines? And of course, there isn't a simple answer. There are many, many, many things that um, cause decline in, and I'm focusing primarily on Caribbean coral reef communities because they're, well, they're further gone, I guess we'll say, than most uh, Indo-Pacific reef communities. But there is a host of problems that have affected corals. Um, Thermal stress and bleaching, I know we're all familiar with the changing environment that these coastal communities occupy, include both global factors like, like global warming and ocean changes, but also those interact with local stressors like pollution and other things. And as these different types of stressors interact, I think that's really where these disease impacts, which are so devastating in most um, Caribbean areas, particularly the Florida Keys, um, you know, that disease is a manifestation of a bunch of different problems that the corals are experiencing, but that's sort of our proximal observation of the cause of death for much of the Caribbean coral. But consequent with this, or coincident with this massive mortalities of corals that we observe sort of in real time, again, this picture shows a bleaching event that, that occurred um, in the Florida Keys in 2014. Essentially all of that coral died that you see in that picture within two months. Um, as one of these remnant, more or less previously thriving Elkhorn coral stands in the Keys. Um, but consequent with this mass mortality events, we're also observing recruitment failure in most of these reef building sclerotinian species. And so of course, if you are losing a lot of the adults and you don't have babies to replace them, that's how you get those negative trajectories that we saw a moment ago. And this uh, combination of uh, coral mortality and recruitment failure um, has resulted in the endangered species listing of seven species of Caribbean coral. Now what, what you may not realize, we have endangered species of a lot of things, but generally we expect the endangered species to be the species that were rare to begin with, right? The, uh, the California condors or the, you know, the large animals that are rare anyway. In the case of these Caribbean coral species, Two of them, indeed, are, are rare species that un occur uncommonly on reefs. Um, the two in the middle there, Dendrogyra, um, Cylindris, and Mycetophilia ferox, a relatively rare species on the reef. But the other five species are the core reef building fundamental um, foundation species of Caribbean reefs. And those are the ones that are endangered. It isn't the rare species. It's the species that should be everywhere. Um, and so this gives a little bit of a different slant to the understanding of um, maybe how we want to respond to that type of, um, that type of decline or that situation. Um, 
partly, well, so that the sort of the history of coral restoration then, if we think about what can we do actively to bolster these species and these populations, um, the sort of traditional management approach, at least, at least in the states, has sort of been, yes, we um, engage in reef restoration, but it's something that, that, it's an activity that's limited really to these types of very acute human impacts, such as ship groundings. And for many, many years, that was really the context that reef restoration um, was undertaken, at least um, in the States. The idea being that we should not meddle or interfere in natural disturbances because natural recovery processes should, um, the natural processes should be able to um, take care of and, and resolve those natural disturbances. And partly as a result of the endangered species listings, but also as these acute disturbance events have continued to occur at shorter and shorter intervals, um, there's been quite a, a dramatic change, um, both in the management perspective, in terms of the appropriateness of raising corals, farming corals, and putting them out in terms of trying to bolster natural populations. But I think also a growing recognition that none of the disturbances that reefs are experiencing these days are truly natural. <laughs> Human footprint is occupying, you know, is, has um, an influence on all of the processes that are going on in the ocean these days. And so the idea of natural disturbance being uh, equal to natural recovery processes is probably not, uh, not really working anymore. And so this has really led to incredible um, uptick in effort and innovation um, in the area of coral restoration and coral propagation. So as you all, I'm sure, are largely familiar, there's two main modes um, with which corals or any animal, I guess, can be propagated. Um, asexual fragmentation is uh, amenable, corals are amenable to fragmentation, and this is a method that's being used extremely effectively um, throughout the Caribbean. Um, initially, these efforts focused on our two main, the branching uh, croprids in the Caribbean, uh, Acropora palmata and, or, well, Acropora cervicornis first and primarily, but expanding those efforts into Acropora palmata, the elkhorn coral. Um, the other approach is to utilize the natural reproductive uh, cycles of corals to um, propagate corals all the way from larvae. So starting with baby corals, um, the, the, the difference, one of the differences in terms of these different approaches is the intent and the effectiveness of increasing genetic diversity by using um, uh, sexual propagation. And this is really the focus of CCOR's work, is developing means and uh, tools to enhance the success of, of larval propagation for restoration. So, why, so again, why is sexual propagation important? It provides genetic recombination um, for the remnant populations. Again, in some cases, with things like uh, Caribbean staghorn coral, in certain geographic regions, there are very few genetic individuals left, honestly, because these are clonal species. A lot of the colonies, even in wild um, populations, may be clonal. And so the total number of genetic individuals that are even available in the wild may be limited. And so by using genetic recombination, we can help maintain and increase the number of genetic individuals that are available in the restored populations. And we, our best understanding from conservation biology and conservation genetics, um, providing those high levels of genetic diversity along with fairly large population sizes are really the best tools that we can provide natural populations for being able to adapt to changing environments, which we know um, are continuing to occur um, in natural reef environments. So although the process is somewhat more complicated, um, we think the value of, of creating that and providing that uh, genetic diversity on the front end of the process is important to, to harness and leverage. And so, as I mentioned, the process of larval propagation is, and the, is complicated. Um, corals have a complex life history. Um, and indeed, many of the steps in that coral life history are ones that we can't really study in the field at all because they're invisible. They happen at night and they happen at microscopic scales, such that our, our sort of natural history knowledge 
of this entire, you know, what, two thirds of the coral life history. It was very, very limited. Um, the growing interest and the growing participation in terms of developing observational and husbandry and, and aquaculture practices for these many life stages now has um, been a gradual process over the past 10 years or so and um, has yielded amazing advances in being able to reliably undertake these many, many steps from collecting the gametes from natural spawning events, um, conducting in situ fertile, or uh, ex situ fertilization, the entire larval development period, and then settlement and grow out. Um, so that's, uh, this is somewhat um, what those stages look like in more of a real life scenario. But to emphasize here, um, this is all happening at a microscopic scale. So this is a one centimeter scale in this small image, and you can barely see those little dots. Those are larvae of, uh, competent larvae of Orbicella fabulata, which is one of those endangered uh, threatened species that I mentioned. So there's a lot of steps here. They're delicate, they happen at night, they happen at very small scales, and they're hard to see. <laughs> So that's our, our task and our challenge, but um, CCOR over the years um, has developed and, and taken on this challenge. Um, as I said, we um, send teams of divers out to collect gametes from natural spawning events. Um, I'm really jealous of Jamie's tea time because we don't enjoy that, <laughs> the methods, the approaches that we're using. But um, again, undertake fertilization generally in a, con in a controlled or laboratory or boat, um, and then getting those larvae um, raised through their planktonic period and into settlement. So we've developed um, means assistive uh, steps to accompany each of these complex steps in this early life history. And again, many of these um, benefiting from the great partnerships that we have with a lot of zoo and aquarium experts and husbandry experts that have partnered with Seacor over the years. Um, this is an example, this is a photograph of a sort of a chrysal arrangement that, sorry, that um, had been developed and, and was successful in raising larvae in this sort of small scales where we've started out. And so that um, husbandry experience has benefited this process um, greatly over the, the years. And we've been successful in raising um, these corals up in, in small numbers. Um, this includes uh, the, those elkhorn corals that I was describing. This is a photo of a four-year-old um, elkhorn coral raised from a larva that now is part of a spawning population in Curacao. Um, four years of age is what that, what that took to grow up. Um, there's a time series on the bottom of uh, brain coral, one of the other uh, species that we're working with. Um, again, they don't grow as fast, but you can see you get a, an inch or two sized colony within three or four years. Obviously, it's gonna take a while for those guys to get to that full uh, colony size, but we can be successful in these uh, larval corals growing up in a reef environment in small numbers. And, Many of those steps are reliable now in terms of collecting the gametes, fertilizing them, raising the larvae, and getting them to settle. The challenge really is in doing that with a lot more corals and getting them to grow up better once they're placed in the natural environment. And so over the past couple of years, CCOR has uh, been focusing a lot of effort in developing, as I said, tools and techniques that will enable um, larger scale uh, propagation of, of larvae and coral settlers, but also relying primarily on, ex, on in situ techniques. Um, many of the areas, especially in the Caribbean, a lot of the areas in the world where coral restoration is needed, there isn't a lot of um, land-based infrastructure or laboratories where we can really do a lot of land-based culture. And so we're really focusing on developing um, means that can be implemented away from that type of um, Infrastructure. So this is kind of a generation one, some illustrations, um, sort of in situ mesocosms that we've been using for our larval, the larval rearing stage and the settlement stage. Um, another aspect we've been working hard on is sort of these designed substrates, which sort of have two goals. 
one goal is to be sort of a self-stabilizing unit that we can use to transfer those settlers into the reef, um, self-stabilizing so that they don't require the labor-intensive activities of gluing or nailing or cable tying those down. They can simply be wedged in by hand. You can kind of see what those look like here in this lower um, panel here where they've just been sort of wedged into the reef. So self-stabilizing shape but also uh, providing a beneficial habitat for those very small settlers to enable them, again, to improve this post-settlement survivorship phase, which is really the bottleneck that we're still very um, focused on improving. So this shows sort of two first-generation um, units. We have uh, conducted quite a few pilot studies with these in various locations. Um, these are conduct, uh, constructed with concrete, uh, molded concrete. And some of the pilot studies that we've been able to do with this unit, um, this is data that Valerie Chamberlain has published from Curacao using Favia frogum, which is actually a brooding coral. But um, showing something like 70% yield, yield meaning the proportion of those seeding units, those substrates that retain at least one live coral after a year, um, a year on the reef. So, is that good or bad? Well, you know, again, we don't know how many natural settlers survive to a year in, in, on a reef because we can't see them and we can't follow them. Um, but we're pretty pleased with this as a, as a first pass, and we have gone on then over the past year um, to take that information both on those first generation pools. You can see here our second generation, both of these in situ rearing pools and then a range of different substrate types that we are testing sort of as we speak. We have these units. Um, the lower picture here was from the Bahamas just last week. I dashed here from the Bahamas um, showing those substrates deployed in one of those new pools. And so we have uh, larvae of both brain corals and star corals that are settling on these as we speak. Again, the goals, it's like, how do we come up with those funky shapes, you know? Um, the, the things that we're after are a capacity to be self-stabilizing, so those spikes and that asymmetry are designed to help those shapes be such that they can uh, wedge themselves into the reef habitat. But then also providing those microhabitats, nooks and crannies, where we know coral larvae like to settle, but nooks and crannies that they have a good chance of growing out of quickly because we know getting into the light is a major factor in them being able to grow in those early phases and maintain their space against the competitors that uh, tend to be the really um, the challenge in that post-settlement survivorship. So just to give you an idea, um, our operation in the Bahamas just last week um, was certainly suboptimal. We had some weather issues with a little tropical storm that was coming by last week, but um, we were able to collect essentially about two million eggs um, from, as I said, amongst two different species. Um, with the, the, the pools and the other um, facilities we had there, we were able to culture really about a half a million larvae um, up through um, capacity, and as I said, the settlement is still underway, so we don't have the data from that, but we're expecting to have about 3,000 seeding units then that have somewhere in the range of 20 to 50 to 100 settlers each one that we'll be out planning in, on Bahamas reefs there in Eleuthera um, in the coming weeks. So that's kind of the scale that we've been able to um, do with these second generation tools that we're using, and we're definitely looking to upscale those numbers dramatically in the coming years. Um, again, when we're thinking about restoring coral reefs, of course, one or two species is not what makes a coral reef. And again, much of the early effort, both in fragmentation culture, but also in the larval work, was really these two Acropora species. Um, but as, as my colleague Valerie Chamberlain likes to put it, we, we maybe kind of started with the hardest ones. <laughs> they have a longer larval phase. Um, they're extremely sensitive. Um, and so we're really concentrating now um, on expanding the suite of species that we are working with. So CCOR right now is actively propagating um, these six species. We have some smaller level efforts where we're um, looking into uh, experiments with the Acropora hybrid here, Acropora prolifera, um, and, and then the annularis there on the bottom. So we're really looking towards expanding the number of species that we can um, outplant to a reef and really un beginning understanding better, I would say, the fact that some of these other coral species um, that aren't the most sensitive ones are actually maybe a little bit easier to work with. 
And so part of our thinking um, in, the, in the midterm is really by having a suite of species available to us, there's a lot more opportunity to populate those species perhaps on reef sites that don't have pristine conditions still, where we know we have degraded um, environmental conditions in a lot of areas. And some of these brain corals or cytorastria probably are gonna be more successful in still getting those types of sites repopulated. And so we'll in the future have more opportunity to sort of mix and match um, different species for a particular site perhaps that we want to um, restore. So that's, again, part of the motivation and really developing and making sure that we have tools that um, are available across uh, many species of coral. Um, so that's kind of what we're able to do now, the immediate uh, tools and uh, approaches that we're really aiming to increase the numbers and increase the survivorship of larvae and of coral propagules that we can put out on reefs. But we know, in the, as I said, the environment is changing rapidly and we still observe continued these, uh, again, shortening intervals of disturbance where we see mass mortality events. And so there is an interest um, and a lot of current research effort that's really focused on you know, uh, utilizing um, observations like I have illustrated here. Um, the lower photo shows two colonies of Orbicella Again, this was 2015 in the Florida Keys, where you have two colonies next to each other. This one's completely bleached, and the one right next to it um, appears perfectly healthy during a, a heating event. And so obviously, we would not like to propagate and restore populations that can act like this one um, and not uh, be susceptible um, as this colony appears to be. Similarly, from some of the, this is, these are, um, illustrations from one of the fragment nurseries in the Florida Keys uh, run by the Coral Restoration Foundation. And you can see each of these rows are different fragments from a separate genotype. And you can see a dramatic and obvious difference in the susceptibility of these in genetic individuals to thermal stress. Again, we experienced a couple of dire thermal stress events in the Florida Keys um, in 2014 and 15 and enabled us to make these observations. <laughs> um, a little bit more effectively than we might have wished. So the question and really the challenge, I think that in coral restoration, um, we really are, are looking into and a lot of really active, both research, but also sort of management and policy planning um, about what of these types of approaches might be appropriate. But the challenge really is to leverage this existing variability that exists still, even in these remnant coral populations that have undergone a lot of decline, this variability and stress resistance to utilize that to restore populations that are gonna have that greater degree of, of resistance. And there are different types of strategies that are being investigated. They all carry some risks, right? These are not approaches that we currently use in wild uh, conservation of natural ecosystems. They're all approaches that we use in agriculture. They're approaches that we use in medicine but they're not approaches that we've used in the past in conservation. And so it's kind of a brave new world that we're thinking about. Um, and so the research really needs to focus both on what are the benefits that some of these approaches might gain us in terms of improving the fate of corals, but also the risks and understanding what risks might accompany them. And so these are aspects such as um, Assisted migration, moving coral genotypes from areas maybe where they've experienced and adapted to warmer temperatures or more variable temperature environments to other areas where they might then have a longer sort of time frame before they meet uh, lethal temperature stress. Um, or tweaking the symbiotic partners that also may confer higher temperature tolerance to those individual colonies. Or selective breeding, obviously, that's maybe an obvious one where, again, we, humans have used these techniques extremely effectively in, in culture of all sorts and in agriculture and aquaculture as well. And so it seems that these are approaches that perhaps could lend um, a better horizon and a better uh, future to corals as well. Um, part of the reason that I'm excited about what CCOR is doing is, again, these techniques and tools that we're developing for larval propagation are the ones that are gonna be needed when and if any of these novel approaches or pro more proactive, dicier approaches um, are decided to sort of move forward with, 
in order to implement them at scale, again, the larval propagation is going to be, uh, have to be a large part of that implementation. So this is really um, aspects that we're looking towards the future to improve the fate of corals in the wild. So I'll sort of sum up uh, with a couple of points. Um, we really have to be diligent and do a better job in conventional coral reef management and conservation and in mitigating climate change if there's going to be an environment that corals are at all able to occupy in the future. So that has to be everyone's uh, top priority. And that includes who you vote for, and it includes how you live and how you choose to um, make decisions about your life. So that's, that's crucial. But when we are thinking about the next 10 to 20 to 30 years and maintaining the pieces of that coral reef puzzle, primarily the corals, um, restoration and breeding can um, yield large numbers of propagules and that we're working to leverage those large number of propagules into repopulating and sustaining those coral populations in this suboptimal environment that they're going to be occupying for the next decade or two. Um, and CCOR, as I said, we're really focused on upscaling and other areas of coral restoration as well. Really the focus is on developing um, methods that involve less work, that are cheaper, more effective, so that we can really match the scale of restoration efforts to the scale of degradation that we're trying to address. Um, I'm going to put a couple of points out here. People often ask what they can do to help out. These are sort of some summary things that um, are true for everyone. Things like, as I mentioned, uh, doing what you can for mitigating uh, climate change impacts. Um, you know, limiting single-use plastics. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of this stuff, but I would encourage you as folks who keep and maintain reefs in your homes, um, you know, do what you can to make sure that those, that your systems are stocked and maintained in a sustainable way, but also use your, your tank and the reef that you house, use that to educate your friends and family to understand that, you know, what you can grow with those, that coral reef in your tank really is, is, is overtaking or overcoming really the status of those corals in their, in their natural environment and use that um, tool that you have, that attractive tool in your home to educate your friends and family to understand um, the fate of corals in the wild. Um, I need to acknowledge the many great uh, partners that support Seacore's work, um, including both, as I said, our zoo and aquarium community, also our research partners, and the Cal Academy of Sciences and the Nature Conservancy that support our work. And I will be happy to take questions and any other ideas or discussion folks have. Thank you very much for your attention.